This video is going to discuss the third and final part of topic 19 of the IA2 chemistry course and we're going to be looking at amino acids and proteins. So we're looking to be able to describe experiments to investigate the characteristic behaviour of amino acids, focusing mostly on their acidity and basicity, how they affect plain polarised light, so talking about chirality, and also how we form peptide bonds. So first of all, what is an amino acid? Well, an amino acid contains an amino group, or an NH2 group, and a carboxylic acid group, or COOH, and they are separated by a carbon atom. Now, because they have this separation of this carbon atom here, that allows that these molecules to keep both their amine and their carboxylic acid properties. Now, they all have this main structure, and they differ in the R group that is attached to it. Now, there are 20 amino acids that are found in humans. There are Some are natural and some are found in the diet. And they're often referred to as two amino acids, or sometimes you may see in literature, they're called alpha amino acids. So here's just an example of a few amino acids. So we have alanine, cysteine, glutamic acid, glycine, and lysine. Now glycine is the most common, or sorry, the most simple amino acid because it is just simply the main group and it's R. R group is an H. Now, don't worry too much about the isoelectric point here. We're gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes. I just want you to have a look at the structure. So you can see that they all share the same structure and what changes each time is the R group that is attached. And that is how we tell apart the different amino acids. The good news is you are not expected to know the structures of amino acids, but you are expected to be able to identify when you do have one. So be on the lookout for both that amino group and the carboxylic acid group on the same structure. Now, amino acids are usually called by their common names like glycine, leucine or alanine and you may come across these most likely in biology if you do study A-level biology. But of course, like any other molecule, they do have IUPAC names and they're named as amine derivatives of carboxylic acids. And we use the prefix amino and we specify where the amino group is. So an example could be 2-aminoethanoic acid or 3-aminopropanoic acid. Give us a try to see if you can draw some of these out so that you can understand where the naming comes from. We do have a couple of displayed formulas here. So we've got our two amino ethanoic acid. So our basis is this ethanoic acid here and it's adding on the amino group in place of the additional hydrogen. So again, you might want to try and draw these yourself just to see if you can do so. So when we're discussing the isoelectric point, so if I just go back in that table, we can see here we've got different values. We have 6, 5.1, 3.2, 6, and 9.7. But we actually need to know what these numbers mean. Now, these numbers actually refer to a pH, and it is the pH of an aqueous solution in which an amino acid is neutral. Now, these values help us understand the acid base properties of amino acids. It helps us understand, is it going to have more acidic properties or is it going to have more basic properties? So amino acids do have the capability to act as both because they do contain this NH2 group that can act as the base or it's obviously got our carbo carboxyl group which can act as an acid. So when we have it acting as a base, it is accepting a proton to form this NH3 positive and we form a hydroxyl, sorry, a hydroxide. If it is acting as an acid, it is donating a proton and we form this hydroxonium here and we get this negative charge. So we do have to understand that it can act as both an acid and a base. Now there is actually a third alternative that you may have never seen before. And what actually happens here is the hydrogen ion from the COOH group can actually transfer over to the NH2 group. So rather than it reacting with water and forming a hydroxonium, it reacts with itself. So this hydrogen transfers over to here and we form this positive end and this negative end and we call this a zwitterion. 
Now, as wetter iron is a molecule that contains a positive and a negative charge in the same molecule, but it is overall electrically neutral. So you'll see that we have a one positive charge and a one negative charge. So these two things will cancel out to make the molecule as a whole neutral, but it does have a positive end and a negative end. And these isoelectronic points, the numbers that we use, tell us the acidity or the basicity of an amino acid. If we have a very low value, it is more likely to act as an acid like this. So if we have a low isoelectronic point, we're going to have it acting as an acid. If we have a high isoelectronic point, it is going to be acting as an alkali or it's going to be acting as a base. And if it is at the, if it is actually at the isoelectric point, then it is going to exist as, as wetter iron, and that is when it is electrically neutral. So just be aware that these numbers do have meaning, and they can tell you whether it is more likely to act as an acid or a base. All amino acids can also form salts with any other acid or base. So for example, glutamic acid can react with sodium hydroxide, and we can form three possible salts. Now, we don't need to know the structures of these salts, but we have actually probably come across one in life, and it is called monosodium glutamate, or otherwise known as MSG. And it's used as a flavour enhancer in food, but there is a lot of controversy around MSG and its health benefits. If you wish to read up more on this, I'm sure you'll be able to find something on the internet. Now, the majority of our two amino acids all have a chiral centre. This means that they are optically active. Now, remember, a chiral centre is when the carbon is connected to four different R groups. The one exception to this is glycine, because it does contain two hydrogen atoms connected to the carbon. So glycine is not a chiral. All of the others will be chiral, so if we have aqueous solutions of the enantiomers, if we remember back to topic 15, where we looked at chirality, if we have equal amounts of our enantiomers, then we can get a racemic mixture, but if we have unequal amounts, we're going to be getting a rotation of our plane polarised light, and we end up with dext dextro rotatory or the level rotatory. And as I said, if we have equal amounts, then we get this racemic mixture and then we don't see any polarisation and we don't see any rotation. Again, if you can't remember about enantiomers, please have a look back at topic 15 and you will be able to find lots of information about that just to give yourself a refresher. Now, when we get two amino acids reacting together, we can get an acid-base reaction happening. Now, we can get a condensation reaction, and the amino acids are joined together by the formation of this amide group. And we call this a peptide bond. Now, you've probably seen peptide bonds before if you have studied A-level biology, which I'm sure most of you have. When we've got the peptide bond, we can form something called a dipeptide and that just means that we have two possible structures with two amino acids being formed. So we can either have the alanine coming first followed by the glycine with our peptide bond or we can have the glycine followed by the al alanine again with our peptide bond and then both reactions of course it's a condensation reaction so we are going to be removing water. When we get a three different amino acids forming, or combining, sorry, we can call these tripeptides, and we can have six possible combinations. Now, rather than drawing out all the structures, the way that we can summarise these is to use the three-letter codes. Now, again, you're not expected to memorise the three-letter codes. These would be given to you in the question, should you be asked about them. But it's just a case of putting them in various different orders so that we get six possible outcomes. So starting with alanine, and then changing it up to start with cytosine, and then changing it up to start with the glutamic acid. And we get these six possible combinations for our tripeptides this time. Now, what you may be more familiar with is actually the term polypeptide. Now, remember, poly means many. So this is many peptide bonds. So these are actually long chain polymers, and they're formed by the condensation 
polymerization of many amino acids. Now, long chain polypeptides are slightly different to proteins because proteins have further levels in their structures. Again, if you have studied biology, you will have probably went into a bit more detail about this, but we make the polypeptide chain which is all the amide groups being formed by the condensation polymerization. And then these can interact in various different ways to make things called secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structures. And these are our proteins. Now, the good thing is we're not actually required to know the structures of these in terms of the chemistry course. You may study this in biology. Now, proteins are going to have extremely large molar masses because we're going to be combining very large amounts of amino acids. We could be even combining upwards of 5,000 amino acids. <clears throat> it's very important that we know, first of all, which amino acids are present, and then we also have to know the order in which they occur. So the diagram that is shown here is a polypeptide of insulin. Now we can see that insulin contains approximately 51 amino acids and it has a molar mass of about 5,700 grams per mole. We increase that for hemoglobin up to 66,000 and for urease up to 480,000. And you can see each time we are getting an increase in our approximate number of amino acids. Now we can of course break down these proteins just the same way as we can break down any condensation polymer and we do that by hydrolyzing the molecule <clears throat> and that will break it back down into our individual amino acids and the way that we do this is to prolong heat it with concentrated hydrochloric acids. We then protonate all of the amino, amino groups due to the acidic conditions and by doing this we're going to break all of the peptide bonds and we go back to our individual amino acids. And of course, these could then be deprotonated should we need that. Now, when we hydrolyze a protein, we can actually then confirm which amino acids are present. And we can do this by using chromatography. Now, at international A level, we are not required to know too much about how we do the chromatography of proteins. You know how to carry out chromatography because you did learn about that back in topic 15. But in terms of how we get them to show and how they actually react, that is for the domestic paper. So we don't need to go into the detail. But just to give you a brief overview, we have the hydrolysis reaction take place. We then spot onto the chromatography paper and we run the, chro the chromatogram. Now the problem here is that the amino acids are colourless, so we have to spray them with a developing agent. And the most common one that is used is called ninhydrin. When we do that, we can then calculate our RF value. So remember, an RF value is the distance moved by the spot divided by the distance of the solvent front. And it should also always be less than one. If you ever get an RF value that is above one, then you have made a mistake in your calculation. And by calculating these RF values, we can then compare them to um, specific values that have been calculated in a laboratory and our control samples and then we can identify the individual amino acids. So let's have a look at a past paper question for amino acids. We're going to look at the January 2017 paper and we are looking to draw a sweated ion for tyrosine. Now remember a sweated ion is when this hydrogen from the carboxylic acid group transfers over to our amino group. So we're going to have a structure that looks a little bit like this. So we're going to have NH3 plus, let me try that again, we're going to have H3N plus with the carbon connected to our carbonyl and then our negative oxygen. And then we just complete the rest of the structure as shown in our diagram. And that is what our sweater ion is going to look like. The positive charge can be anywhere on the NH3 and we can show the uh, negative charge should be on the oxygen. Make sure that we don't have the oxygen on the phenol group down at the bottom. It is the hydrogen from the carboxylic acid that does move to the NH2 group. 
<clears throat> then we want to look at how we can show two optical isomers of serine. Well, first of all, we have to identify within our structure which is the chiral center. So it's going to be this carbon in the center here because you can see it is connected to one, two, three, four different groups. And we want to arrange these around our carbon in our diagram so that we can have our optical isomers. So remember, an optical isomer should be a mirror image of each other. So let's draw out the first one, keeping it nice and simple, as like the same as we've got there. We start with the hydrogen, we move round to the carboxyl, then to CH2OH, and then to the NH2, just moving around in a clockwise direction. So now if we want to do the enantiomer, we're going to be moving in an anti-clockwise direction, but keeping the same groups. And our NH2. So we can see that these two things are going to be mirror images of each other. They are non superimposable. And that is the definition of an enantiomer. Again, if you're not sure about enantiomers, please go back to topic 15 and have a look at the textbook or find some past paper questions. Make sure that you do know what optical isomers are and how to draw them. That's everything for amino acids and proteins and that wraps up topic 19. I hope this video has been useful for you to understand all the concepts that you need to know. If there's anything that you're not sure about, please feel free to leave a comment and I hope to see you back on the channel for future topics and good luck with any revision.